Hey, I'm Sean Hammond with PremierGuitar.com. I'm with Tyler Sweet doing a rig rundown of Brian Setzer's gear. How's it going, man? Good. I'm doing great today. Good. So we're starting with the guitars. And why don't you tell us what we've got here? We have a, a 1959 Gretsch uh, 6120. This is uh, Brian's original guitar that he played in the Stray Cats. Um, you know, it was basically in all the videos, and uh, he's had it for a long time. He bought it when he was you know, just a young kid. And... Uh, He's uh, broken it back out again uh, in the last uh, year and sounding great and he's totally digging it. Now it looks like, has he made some cosmetic changes like different stickers and uh, different dice on the knobs and stuff? Yeah, I mean, over the years he's uh, you know changed a couple things here and there. Uh, I believe, I'm not really positive, but I think it had originally had maybe had a black cat on it at one point in time too. And But uh, yeah, this is, this is the baby. Uh, this is his uh, pride and joy. So what's the like care regimen for this guitar every day? Do you, does that get special treatment after each show or yeah, special yeah. things you have to do with it because it's older? or? No, I mean, you just uh, take care and maintain it just like it would any other guitar and uh, you know, change the strings every uh, couple of shows because Brian has such a nice light touch that uh, you know, he likes worn in strings more, you know, for that sound and tone. But, uh, you know... It uh, basically gets the same treatment as everybody else, and you know, fret dressing uh, every month, or you know, when needed, basically. And uh, yeah, you said he's you said he's pretty particular about the strings and so forth. What brand and gauge is he using right now? Uh, we're using a, a Daddario 10 through 46, mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, you know, Brian. He, in terms of like, he likes the the older sound. Uh, you know, they'd, rather than the new string sound, he'd rather he would rather have me leave these on here for a month. Have a little slime on it, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I don't I don't do that. Yeah. I do them every two shows just in case, yeah. just so I don't have to, uh, you know, come up on the deck here if I don't have to. Yeah. You know, it's a good thing. Can we get a closer look at the saddles there? I'm wondering, mm -hmm. are those the stock saddles for his signature model, or do you uh, do anything special with these saddles? No, it's basically uh, these these guitars uh, were set up by TV Jones uh, when Brian you know brought them out and uh, he did he does most of the work for it so it's basically my maintenance on the road and stuff but you know of course that that's not original you know yeah. every a lot of things you know the zero fret is gone of course and uh, you know the saddles are they used to be rollers so now these are TV classics in here they are yep yeah. they believe. look pretty old yeah. They're all rusty and yeah, each uh, changed them out and done work. I think they have the old covers on, on them, but I'm pretty sure that they were uh, changed to TVs, pickups. But they actually, who knows? They might be the originals. That screws there because Brian broke this guitar in Japan a long time ago. Uh, he went to throw it to uh, the tech at the time and stepped on the cable, and it came a little oh. bit up short, and then decided to toss the neck into the audience. <laughs> and uh, one of our other uh, techs. Uh, Bobby Gilkin uh, ended up uh, Did have to dive into the crowd to no, get I it back. Went out there and the kid was very nervous and you know shaking and <laughs> like, oh my God, what do I have in my hands? And uh, but he got it back from him, gave him a bunch of uh, you know t-shirts and pins and that type of stuff, and he gave it back to us. So. Do you know who fixed that? Did it go to the Gretsch Custom Shop or? Uh, I think I think TV Jones did it. You know, Brian uh, has been dealing with TV for a long time and uh, you know has great trust in him to do do a lot of the work for him so so you can see the crack right there right yeah. and is this a screw that wouldn't normally be there or that would normally be filled in with a little cap or something or yeah no i don't it's i don't think that it's it definitely wasn't originally there no it was like you know put it back together again yeah. type deal does he feel like it has changed how it plays or sounds at all since that happened he did for the longest time he had it in storage at his house and uh you know, just like I said last year, he uh, broke it out again, and I uh, was like, wow, this guitar sounds great again, and I'm going to use this. So we, he brought it out this, uh, this last summer on the, on the European tour we did this summer, excuse me, and, um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been stays in tune nice. So. Cool. Now, this is the one that they had, like, 
they did an MRI on it or something to look at the bracing so that they could do that sort of bracing in his signature models. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. This is the the one, and we have we have another one that is similar to this. Mm -hmm. That uh, I just think is the actual one that they did it to. I don't think it was this one because this was at would have been at the house. They wouldn't have. Uh, he probably wouldn't have sent it anywhere to do that. But they probably uh, used the real number one, which I'll show you in a minute too. Yeah. I know in some of the like in the interview he did with us in our May issue. And in others, he's mentioned how the, the actual 59s are, and the vintage ones are really hard to keep playing and performing well, whereas his um, off-the-shelf guitars, that his signature models are just good to go and sound just as good. Does, is he using this very much each night? or? Uh, yeah, he uses this every single night now. Um, that's his main guitar, or as that. Well, there's like this particular show is broken into two parts. Mm -hmm. So he starts the show with uh, one guitar, plays that for like eight to ten songs, and then he breaks this out for the rest of the show, all the way to the end through the encores and stuff, you know. Okay. And when I get a chance, I'll I'll grab it and tune it, you know, coming off for an encore or something like that. But he he likes it and likes to get it back, so that's what I do for him. Okay, cool. Let's see what else is in the boat. We have a uh, 2010 Gretsch hot rod model with custom paint. Green speckle, which is kind of the colors of our tour, as you can maybe be able to tell by my shirt here, is yeah. trying to kind of matching and some of the backdrops that we have to um, actually, you know, are built around this color pretty much. Mm -hmm. so. so it's kind of like just a theme for the tour. So this is basically a stock hot rod model just with custom paint. Yep, yep, exactly. And it's uh you know set up by uh we got we got two of them from uh Gretsch and uh this is what he uses to uh you know for the first part of the show. And uh he's really digging on it. It's breaking in really nice and uh stays in tune quite well. Cool. Now and on all of these Gretsches the the standard sort of 6120 style hollow bodies. He's use, using the TV classics. Because mm -hmm. I, I know on like some of his, like his um, TV Jones, the baritone guitar or the, uh, what's it called, the C baritone or something like that, mm -hmm. C melody baritone. Yep. I think he uses other TV Jones pickups in that. Is that correct? Yes, he does, yeah. And we don't have any of those guitars out here right now with us, any of the baritone stuff. Uh, just basically uh, the 59s and hot rods are, are what we're using on this tour. So is this another 59? Yes, this is the other 59 that, uh, so you know, I've been with Brian five years now, and this was the main guitar for you know, the first four and a half and uh, until he broke the Stray Cat guitar out. But uh, this is pretty much the same uh, thing. It's, you know, it's gone through uh, some hard times. It's been stolen twice, and we got it back both times, which is you know remarkable. Well, I was going to say, but no broken neck, but actually it looks like right there it did I have a break? Yeah, at one point in time it might have got some type of crack or something, but... Oops, sorry. And there's your bolt there, like you were saying. Now, I know that Brian doesn't usually use the, uh, what some people call a mud switch on here. Has he had the, those disconnected, or does he just avoid no. hitting it? Or No, this this one, it's uh, still connected. It's... Uh, a tone uh, master and uh, you know a pickup selector, basically master, is what they run. And it's uh, yeah he he has different configurations that he uses, but you no know, mainly it's pickups. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now when I look, sorry I'm geeking out here, but when I look at the bridge here and the string pull on there, it's there's not a big break angle. Is that a problem with tuning it all or? Uh, no, this guitar uh, stays in tune. We we have uh, on back of all these bridges we uh, mount double-sided tape, mm -hmm. so I'm able to move them around wherever I want to move them, and uh, that's where it intonates good. That's where it goes. Okay, so both the original 59s have taped bridges, but the signature models are pinned, right? Um, no, the signature models I pu I've pulled the pins out of those oh, really? to the um, of the green guitars. Excuse me, of of the newer two green guitars that I have and. Uh, I just double side stick tape everything, so it's just now, much easier to deal with. Is that something you suggested, or did Brian request that? Or? Um, no, I mean, it's a, a trick of the trade, but you know, there's you know a lot of people do it. So I mean, I I knew about it, and I figured that it would be a cool thing to do here too. And you know, he had a couple of guitars that TV, of course, already had set up like that too. So I was like, oh, he's using it. So, so I guess having the bridges pinned like on his signature models isn't 
was that his idea or just the factories? Do you know? Uh, I don't. I don't really know. It's probably like a factory thing that that's you know how they do stuff and and. Uh, but I mean, if 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 it works, and it's just a question of the guitar, how the guitar is going to break in. And with any new guitar, especially using Bigsby's, mm -hmm. they're going to take time to break in. You got to play them and play them and play them until they get their you know their spots. You know. So you, if I'm understanding you correctly, you felt like. Um with the bridge pinned as you maybe went through different humidity levels and different areas that it was changing the intonation and you needed to have the the flexibility to move it a little bit yeah absolutely um that happens all the time um you know to be able to you know lengthen or shorten the field in different situations it just makes it much easier you know with the pins there you can't you can't do that so you know sometimes you don't get as much um you know shortening of the field, pulling sharp and that type of stuff. But yeah, they're very, very temperamental. Okay, Tyler, so we've got another green um, hot rod here with basically just different finish. Yeah, it's, uh, the paint has a little bit bigger of a speckle in it. And, uh, you no, know, it was, uh, originally, I don't, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, they were shooting for different ones or if something was mixed a little bit wrong or something. I don't really, uh, I don't really know what the deal is with it, but we ended up getting two, so. Cool. <laughs> well, I'll take it if you guys aren't in. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. now, it, <laughs> now, did you say Brian is not playing this one very much? Uh, he is and he isn't. You know, he gets, he likes, um, once he gets a feel of one, you know, because they feel a little bit different, you know, with, and with him having such a, a light touch, he can feel so much in guitars, like not like the average person would be able to feel, you know. Like if I, you know, if I was to play this, I could feel it a little bit, but. Not like the way he can. He he knows what he likes, and uh, he definitely likes the other one better right now. But you know that can change, and I'm sure we'll get good use out of it. Now, speaking of the light touch, um, as I look at it, it, looks like he likes pretty low action, huh? He does. Yes. You know, we don't get uh, too much string buzz. I try to set it right where it's where it's going to be happening for him, and uh, you know, and he'll let me know if he thinks something's a little bit too low or a little bit too high. He's like, you know, Ty, move that a little bit for me. So. As you come to a new town each night, how much time do you have to spend with the guitars? Um, usually get a couple hours each day. But, you know, as I said, I change strings every other day or so, or even sometimes two or three days because he likes to uh, have the, you know, older dead strings on there. It's probably because the amp volume is so loud and just, you know, it's killing it basically. Okay, so. okay Tyler, so next up we've got Brian's famous basement amps which are the 6g6 b circuit which is a pretty rare one right it is it is we we uh carry about four of them with us uh we, of course we have a couple in the in the warehouse too if we need to ship them out to do any tv or you know quick appearance type things but um they range from i believe 1961 to 63 uh era and uh they're, of course they're all brown face and all 6g6 b's and uh credible credible amp you know, everybody, everybody's in search of them these days. Yeah. And the reason, correct me if I'm wrong, the, one of the big reasons why he likes it is because they have a solid state rectifier? They do, yeah. yeah. And it's uh, some of the uh, older tubes that he found uh, back in the 80s. It was a company that was going out of business that had a big stock of AMS tubes. So he just purchased all of them. So he, that's basically what we run is, and nobody else can really get that tone from those too because no one else has them so okay, so what was that what was the brand again it's ams it's, uh, i think that's part of the secret too that it makes it really uh i haven't heard that good. before that's cool yeah. were they preamp tubes and yep. power tubes yep preamp and power tubes and you know i, I believe when he originally bought them it was like you know 150 premu pre tubes and um you know probably about 60 sets of matched you know, output tubes, so. Wow, and he's still running off the ones he bought in the 80s. Yeah, I think it was the late 80s he found them or something. I forget the story. Someone told me. You know, I've, so I've only been here five years, and some of the guys have been here 20 years, so, but these so I'm kind of the new guy, you know. <laughs> but these still have AMS tubes in them. They do, yes. And, and, I, and of course, I have, uh, you know, my bias probes and my tube testers and all that stuff, so I constantly keep up, uh, up to date of... Uh, you know, keeping a records book of when I'm changing them, and I'm a firm believer of 60 hours for your output tubes and about 200 on the the pre pre tubes. So, 
how often do you have to check those out? Um, usually it's by tone, but I, I keep a, you know I, keep, I do keep track pretty well of how many shows we're doing and the time limit and stuff of the shows and so you know every every like every two tours or something I'll really if they you know they're month long tours or something like that I'll actually take them out and you know do a lot of the electric socket cleaning get some of the carbon out of there and that type of stuff too so I try to keep that really clean also. What do you think he's gonna do when he runs out of those AMS tubes? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Won't be for probably about another 10 years, but um, hopefully by then we'll all be living in like an island somewhere. <laughs> you know, of course, he has a backup back there. Mm -hmm. And I assume it's basically the same specs and everything. Does he use the exact same settings on that or does he go through by ear and just set it by ear? Because obviously there are probably some resistors that are different values or different tolerances or different materials or something in the other head. Yeah, I mean, dude, it, it all goes by ear with, with him. I mean, we have a basic general setting that we start off things with, and, and usually before tours when we're doing rehearsals, we'll actually go through the amps one by one, and, you know, I make, uh, take notes of, you know, what he's liking, you know, in terms of each amp, you know, A, B, C, D amps is basically how we, you know, list them. So, and of course, this is the A amp in the front. It has, uh, you know, a couple of his favorite... Uh, his uh, idols, yeah. Eddie Cochran uh, on the left side here, and uh, Gene Vincent on the uh, the other side over here on the right is uh, you know, both his uh, his like you know favorite guys of all time. And now, what about the speakers in these cabs? Um, they're um, actually I think they're Celestian 30 watts that are in here, Greenback, but they're old, the vintage 30s, so they're not uh, the new stuff. And there was, a, I think there's a, a couple, too, that actually had the um, Jensen speakers in them, too, at, at one point in time. I don't know if those were original or not, either. I don't know what really actually came stocked uh, in these when they came out. Something I should do some research on, I guess. Earlier, when before we had the camera rolling, you were saying that he has, that Brian has about 20 or 22 space echoes, which we'll talk about in a second. Is, it, is that about right? Yeah, in terms of the um, ones, we try to keep them, you know, coming in <laughs> since they're so old, you know. Um, the RE301 came out in 1977, so, you know, he was buying them up, um, you know, mid-80s and stuff, trying to get, get them, get them, get them. And he's got a few pretty uh, new ones at his house, too, but we have a, a bunch in the warehouse that are just basically for parts, and we carry about six with us on the road to, you know, just in case type things, so. But I've been having, I, you know. Good luck with this one right here. So, <laughs> look like they're in immaculate condition. Mm -hmm. um, but back on the amps, just for one more second, do you know how roughly how many basement heads and two twelve cabs he has in his collection? Um, well, I know of eight, but I'm sure that there's you know he's probably got ones that haven't even seen road use or something mm -hmm. at the house and stuff. You know, and he's a he's a guitar collector too and yeah. stuff. So he has a he has a lot of cool stuff that he's that he's found, and, and he's always always looking all the time, always searching for more echoes. Or, uh, you know, we found this German echo when we were in Berlin last year, and you know, he bought that up too. I forget what the brand was at this point in time, but uh, pretty sweet, you know, like one of the first German units. You know, so he's always buying things. As far as settings on the Space Echo, mm -hmm. does it? stay pretty much the same or does he fiddle with it during the show or uh, yeah there's um pretty much stays the same for most of it but um you know once in a while there'll be uh he uses you know some chorus and a couple tunes or you know it's more reverb less reverb type thing but for the most part it just uh it stays the same he just you know if, if he feels that he's not getting enough of something he'll go over and play with it and stuff and is there a specific year he shoots for when he's looking for space echoes on the market? Um, I don't think so. I think if they're, you know, they're in good condition and working. So, I mean, you, you, if you're looking from, what, 1977 to, what, 86 was when they, I think, stopped making them. I forget the year. Do you know the year they stopped making them? Somewhere around there. 77, I know, is when they came out with the 301. But, um, yeah, I don't, th I don't think there's any particular... Uh, you know, year that he's actually like is better than another year, you know, so. Okay. Can we talk about the mics that you've got on the cabs here a little bit? Yeah. Um, our uh, house guy, uh, front of house guy Jimbo knows a lot more about them than I do, but I think they're, uh, 
like a Mojave, yeah, large yeah. diaphragm, mm-hmm. yeah, and a Royer. And there's a Roy and the Royer mics, yeah, which Jimmo has uh, a thing going with. So we got a bunch of Royer mics out here, and like a ribbon of mm-hmm. 121 or something. Yeah, I think that's. I think you're right about that. That's what it is. Is Brian pretty particular about the cables he uses, instrument cables, or the patch cables going from his space echo to his amps? Or? Uh, not, not really particular. As long as they work and they're, you know, the amp doesn't die, that's the main thing. But you know, I make a lot of the cables too for him. Um, a lot of stuff I use cable. I use is of course Belden cable. I find to be the best that I that I like the most. And uh, why do you like that the best? It's just it's you know it's heavy duty. It's it's nice. It's strong. It, uh, you, know, you can step on it a thousand times and it doesn't crack and break, you know, so. Is it mostly about the the durability or is it also like, do you care about the capacitance issues or anything? There isn't really too much capacitance issues. You know, when you start losing that is when, you know, you're making cables that are 50, 60 feet long and stuff like that. But, you know, basically I keep them in standards like, you know, 30 footers and between 30, 35. I, I mean, I have a couple actual 50s for, you know, big giant you know casino stages uh-huh. that they you know do you know plays and stuff in and that type of stuff but broadway stuff but uh mainly yeah we have a silent pin on one side that's you know that's a must to uh so you know when, so that when he unplugs it yeah, doesn't it's not popping and uh that's that's about uh that's about it really with the cables a double gretch hot rod pick you know our torque colors are green and black and so we have green and black uh picks for uh, the tour, they're mediums. Just yeah, it's like a sta- standard, standard medium, celluloid Fender mediums. Yep. Some red ones. Tyler, thanks so much for showing us this stuff. Yep. It's been really cool, and uh, good luck on the road. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. I'm Sean Hammond. Thanks for watching PremierGuitar.com.